you don't have a sermon outline, please lift your hand. You will need one in the life of our church. We study the Bible in an in-depth way. The sermon outlines will keep you from getting lost. You really need one. Just lift your hand and let these gentlemen be glad. They will be glad to give you one. This morning we return to our study of Titus, this great powerhouse little book in the back of your New Testament. It is one of the letters that was written to a pastor. And it was written to a pastor and to the churches that he is seeking to lead and to guide. Some churches that had a lot of trouble. Churches that had trouble within uh, the uh, life of the churches that were there on this little island. And this morning we come to uh, helping them straighten out some of that trouble by dealing with their leadership. If you're looking at your outline there, notice here what it says um, in the box that's on the page. We see this. I want to read it. Uh, right at the beginning here of the message so you can see our main text. And it comes from Titus chapter 1, and uh, we're really looking at verses 5 through 9. So look with me in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. It says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put together, excuse me, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Verse 6. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, verse 7, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Can you underline those words? Must be above reproach. It's said again. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent, or greedy for gain. Verse 8, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This morning we continue in this picture of looking at the qualifications of a pastor. Why is this important? I believe that Christianity, if you simply look and see what has happened in many, many churches, makes this rather self-evident. Why is this important? I would say that over the last hundred years that for very many churches the standard of leadership has gone down and gone down and gone down. And as time has gone on, if the guy looks good, he smells good, and he seems a little bit eloquent, he seems to have some type of intelligence, perhaps he can be a pastor. And so very often those who have not been qualified, either spiritually or in preparation, have been placed into position, and that has a long-term, overarching, detrimental effect upon the church. Just because someone has a powerful personality does not mean that they are qualified to be a pastor. Just because someone is eloquent does not mean that they are qualified to be a pastor. Just because someone is extremely creative does not mean that they are qualified to be a pastor. This morning, we really begin the beginning of these key elements that that churches must look to in order to understand what is it that God is talking about. Now, this whole issue comes up in the review. I want you to notice here and fill this in that this whole issue comes up because the Apostle Paul and Titus have served together for many years, proclaiming the gospel and establishing local churches everywhere they went. 18 plus years, perhaps more than that, they had served together. Now, not always. They very often, as in the case that you see here, that Titus would get left to do a job. Sometimes he perhaps wouldn't see Paul for over a year. Um, So it wasn't that they were always together, but they were always on the same team seeking to plant churches and seeking to help those churches be solid, true churches in the early church. Now, there's several blanks here. I want you to fill these in and notice them with me. The Apostle Paul and Titus constantly had to deal with false what? Teachers, okay? That could be one of two things, as you're going to see. False teachers, 
They were constantly opposing. You read through 1 Corinthians, you read through Galatians, you read through uh, Titus, you're going to see that there were false teachers in the churches. Our church has been recognizing that over the last few years as we've really been studying the Bible, that there's a real problem with false teachers. That's been the case for 2,000 years in the life of the church. Not only false teachers, but false teachers bring what? False doctrine, very good, false doctrines. So that those, those wind up derailing the church. Those wind up getting people's eyes off the gospel, eyes off of the Lord, onto someone or onto something or onto self. And not only do we see false teachers in false doctrines, but ungodly or worldly behavior. God calls his people to act differently, to behave differently than the world. We're not called to love and act like the world. We're called to love and act like God. And that is the, there's a grand difference there. This is part of the great struggle of faith. This is part of the great per, the plan of God that we would look to God in faith in the midst of a world that has many, many affections that vie for our attention. We see that the Apostle Paul not only dealt with... with uh, ungodly and worldly behavior in the churches, but we also see this leftover, and I'm this key word here, bondage. There's a leftover bondage to the Mosaic law or to Judaism. This has been a real problem as you look through the first three decades of the church. You see, out of Jewish law comes the gospel. Out of the law comes this need for salvation. But there are some, when salvation comes, decide to hold on to the law instead of holding on to the grace of God, which is the fulfillment of the law. It's the law being fulfilled, and this is what Christ would be, and this is what he would do. Well, there were some who, as the gospel was being preached, there were people that would still show up and say, hey, you still have to be Jewish. You still have to hold on to the law. Instead of looking out, the grace that is offered through the sacrifice of Christ, the final once and for all sacrifice of Christ. So they were constantly having to deal with that issue. You know, we still have some doctrines here in this generation, here in 2017, that we are constantly having to deal with. Now, it may not be the law from the Mosaic law and Judaism that we are having to live down, but it may be the worldliness that is around, you, around us that is seeking to make its way into the church, seeking to help the church or to draw the church to be like the world, seeking to play on our senses and seeking to play on our affections out of the world instead of looking and focusing upon God. In the life of our church, we've talked a lot about the difference between cultural Christianity and what? Thank you, biblical Christianity. On this side is cultural Christianity, we'll say, and on this side, biblical Christianity. Cultural Christianity kind of says, I'm okay, you're okay, come do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, look good, do these things. If you smell like a Christian, you must be a Christian. Biblical Christianity says, hey, don't be looking at all of the things on the outside and don't be looking at all of the things in your American heritage or your evangelical heritage. Instead, be looking to the truths of the Bible and what God has said. In biblical Christianity, what we're saying is, no, indeed we focus on what God has done, not what we are doing. And so there is a grand difference. We similarly have to live down and similarly have to continue to refocus constantly, not dealing with Mosaic law like they did in this point, but perhaps cultural Christianity versus biblical Christianity. Look at number three. Paul's first concern for Titus is indeed establishing godly leadership in the churches of Crete. This is Paul's first concern. He recognizes that if the leadership of the church is wrong, the church is going to be wrong. If the leadership of the church is messed up, the church is going to be messed up. The church has to have the right leadership. And so straight out of the box, after the introduction, he says, and look with me in verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put 
appoint elders in every town as I directed you. He's saying if we're going to get a hold of these churches and help these churches be healthy, we have to recognize that this craziness that's going on with the leaders that have seeped into these churches is, is going to have to be dealt with. And so that's the very initial thing that they're dealing with. Now, we don't know what all the issues were with the messed up leaders in the churches at Crete. But we do have some insight into our own culture about certain misconceptions about what's appropriate for a pastor. And I've been thinking about these this week, and, and some of you are going to just really relate to these and see these. And um, I think in these next two sections right here, this may be very eye-opening to some of you. Um, I hope for all of us. But I want you to consider this before we dive into this issue of the qualification of being above reproach. You see, there are some modern misconceptions of pastors. The first one I want you to see here is that pastors are not to be dictators that coerce their subjects. That is not what a pastor is supposed to be. A pastor is not the potentate that controls all things and that seeks to dictate all of things that are, that are there. Some of you have, have been around that over the last hundred years. Um, well, I don't think anybody here is a hundred years old, um, but over these last several decades. But let's just go ahead and say it, that pastors are not called to be dictators. Look at the next one that is there. Pastors are not to be elected officials either that represent their constituents. There are some people who say, okay, so he's not supposed to be a dictator, but we've put in place and he's supposed to do what we're supposed to do. He, we want him to, you know, we, do, we, we begin to overlay governmental ideas in earthly leadership ideas upon the church. Look at the third one there. Pastors are not to be judges that arbitrate disputes. It's not like there's a judge that has been placed here in order to be the final decision on this in, in all things. Look at the number four. Pastors are not to be executives that lead a corporation. That's not the picture of what a pastor is supposed to be. Number five, pastors are not to be entrepreneurs that innovate and create a business. As wonderful as innovation is in ministry, as, long, as wonderful as creation is in various things, this is not the key focus of a pastor. Number six, pastors are not to be managers that run an organization. They're not to be the ones who are just seen as the management. Number seven, pastors are not to be promoters or marketers that are pushing a product or a service. That's, that's when, we, when we lower the gospel to seeing pastors as, well, he's a promoter of this thing, and he's a marketer. If he's really good at marketing, then the church does really well. You see, there's, there's some temptations in all of this, in all of these things, and uh, that we, we have to be very careful of. Finally, look at number eight. Pastors are not to be entertainers that simply wow or move a crowd. That's, that's not the picture of what a pastor is supposed to be. Um, what's interesting is, is that pastors at one point or another may have to execute many of these different types of roles at different times, have different types of strengths along these lines and be used in different ways similarly to some of these things. But if we begin to see pastors through this kind of a lens, then we are sorely mistaken about what true pastors are. Instead, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me over to 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, we see, and this is right next to your Bible in Titus, where you've been studying, I want you to see the imagery that the Bible gives about what a pastor is and what he is not. And we see this rather clearly, um, and it's a, it's a tremendous contrast to the things that we've just listed. Look with me in 2 Timothy in chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Timothy, make sure you're not in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, or it's also on the screen 
in front of you. Look what he says there in verse 1. You then, my child, now this is Paul writing to Timothy, a young pastor. So this is a letter to a pastor. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to what? Faithful men who will be able to teach others. So he is talking about Timothy trusting the gospel to other pastors and other leaders. We, we learn that that's where this is going. So they are to be faithful men who are able to do what? They're able to teach others also. Look at verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. He says, you, you know, the, the, the military guy doesn't go just get involved with all the people in the village and all of that. He is more concerned about what his commander has called him to do. He's not taking orders from the surrounding village. He is taking orders from his commander. So that's the idea of the soldier that is here. Look at verse 5. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Verse 6. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Verse 7. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now, I want you to see here that there is some biblical imagery that is vastly different than what the world looks at when it comes to leadership. And we as Christians, we as people at Sheridan Hills, ought to look at this imagery and uphold this imagery. First of all, pastors are to be faithful men who carry on the ministry. That's what we see at the beginning of this in verse 2. And I want you to see that in verse 2. It's on the screen. And what have you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who are able to teach others? So these are, these are guys who are faithful. Secondly, we also see in that very same verse, pastors are to be teachers. They are to be teachers who carefully teach God's truth. And so if, if a pastor is not able to teach, then he is not truly a pastor because this is a key ingredient, as we'll see in the coming days. Look at number three. Pastors are to be, we, we see the imagery of a soldier, a soldier who is on active duty, remembering who his commander is. Verses three and four. We also see that pastors are athletes who compete to win according to the rules. They don't just make it up as they go. They are competing according to what God has said. You see, that's a great danger when a pastor begins to ignore what God has said and say, well, what works? Let's look for what's practical. Let's look for what works. I mean, people aren't interested in that. They're interested in this. And we start to ask questions like that and begin to ignore what God has said, then that's when we begin to say, well, we're not truly being the soldier that is under the command of the leader. We're not playing by the rules as the athlete. We're starting to make up things as we go. How about this one, number five? Pastors are to be hardworking farmers, cultivating for a harvest. Um, I remember when I was in seminary, uh, I had a guy named Dr. Skinner, uh, not the psychologist. Um, he was not a Christian. Um, but Dr. Skinner was a, was a pastor from Mississippi. And he said, gentlemen, I hate to say it, but over the last hundred years, there's been plenty of pastors that were pretty lazy. And you guys have got to live that down. There's some people that look around and they go, Pastor, what do you do all week? Do you have another job? Um, now there's some pastors who are bivocational. Um, but um, he said, try not to be offended when people say that. Um, but you need, to be, you need to be willing to work. That's one of the things that we train in just about every one of our young men that are here in the life of the church and our young women who are wanting to serve the Lord. We're saying, don't be afraid of hard work. Go for it with everything you've, had, you've got. One of the things that we said when we were overseas and we would have volunteers come in and work on some very hard projects that were there, um, both in France and in Spain and Morocco and even in Algeria, we would often tell people, hey, look, um, don't watch work, join it. 
Don't ask if you can help. Ask how you can help. Um, the picture is enjoy the work. Jump into the work. A pastor has to be willing to work. Number six, pastors are to be careful workmen, skilled in their labor. So it's not just willing to do the hard work and be main force in ignorance, but it's also that they have to be thoughtful in this. And we see that the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, be a workman that does not need to be ashamed, being able to divide the truth or being able to teach the Word of God. We see in verse 21, number 7, pastors are to be honorable vessels carrying on honorable work, not be an dishonorable vessel, not be an unclean vessel, but a clean vessel. Be that which is honorable, be that which is respectable in this way in which his life is conducted. And number eight, perhaps one of the most important in this imagery that is so very different from the imagery above is found in verse 24, pastors are to be the Lord's slaves. Do you see the word that comes after slaves there? Pastors are to be the Lord's slaves. What is that word? Doulos or doulos. It's the word for slave. It's not merely a servant, but it's a slave. And we've been looking at the fact that throughout the Bible we see that God's people are called his slaves. And he is the good master. He is the righteous master. He is the master that takes care of his own. So we see that this picture is here in even enduring evil as time goes on. Look at the last part that is here, and this is imagery that is so very important. It's at the bottom of the page, but it's not at the bottom of the importance. It's perhaps the highest importance. And I want you to get this before we move on. Notice this with me, that perhaps the most prevalent in the New Testament is the image of shepherd shepherd, and that is literally what pastor means. When you use the word pastor, you are saying shepherd. It's the word poimen in the Greek. And this shepherd imagery begins with Jesus. Jesus himself is the great shepherd. Jesus himself is called the chief shepherd. Jesus himself is called the good shepherd. And so whenever there's a pastor, he is really what we would call an under shepherd. Jesus is the great high chief. He is the great high priest. He is the great prophet and king, but he is also called a shepherd. Now, some of you turned over your page, but don't do that. Go back. There's a reason. Caught you. Here we are. Look at the first group up there at the top. In fact, let's read the words that you filled in, um, one through eight. Dictators, right, that was nobody. Okay, are you all ready? Let's read the words up there. Modern misconceptions, modern misconceptions. What did we say? Dictators, elected officials, judges, executives, entrepreneurs, managers, promoters, marketers, or entertainers. Now, look at the one below that. Let's read those. Faithful men, teachers, soldiers, athletes, hardworking farmers, careful workmen, honorable vessels, the Lord's slaves. Now, there is a pretty big contrast between those two groups. When we look at the way the world seeks to lead things, it typically has to do with status, and it typically has to do with power, and it doesn't very often have to do with humility, but more to do with pride and force. But when you begin to look at the beautiful imagery of God and his people, you begin to see that there's this, this issue of faithfulness, there's this issue of of truth and the fact that the truth comes and brings freedom. You see, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will do what? It'll set you free. And so the great work and message of the church is not about gaining more market share. 
It's not about gaining more influence in, this, in the, the, the picture that is there in something that is worldly and temporal. It's all about God's march of his kingdom through truth, setting people free from the bondage of sin. And so it's a very, very stark contrast with the way businesses and the way organizations and the way government and the way the, the local level around us is led versus the kingdom of God's work through the body of Christ. I, I, I love the fact that we see this idea of hardworking farmers in this picture, careful workmen, skilled laborers, and then even this idea of slaves. You see, this is, a, this is a very different orientation on leadership. And then finally, before you turn your sheet over, just kind of think about those two different lists. And then the very bottom one that we've listed there, the idea of shepherd. Shepherds, at best, could be called semi-skilled. Most shepherds are, are not very skilled. Most shepherds are not very educated. Most shepherds are, are very simple people that go and spend time with animals all day long. And they watch them. And they move them from area to area. Now, there are some areas of skill that are needed in that. And, and if you have a good shepherd, he is able to, to have a, a more healthy flock of sheep. But just in the agricultural sense, it's a pretty, pretty lowly position. One of my best friends in Algeria was a shepherd. And he said that he would walk out of their town and he would um, watch his flock of sheep and he would lead them over through this rocky terrain. This is on the edge of the Sahara Desert. And while he was out there, as he put it, looking at the back ends of sheep, watching them walk along in the, in the fields, he was listening to a radio broadcast out of Spain. And that radio broadcast, day after day after day, was preaching the gospel. And this shepherd would sit there and listen to that, and he said at the end of every radio broadcast, there would be an invitation to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And one day, after hearing it for months and months and months, he, out there, looking at the back end of a bunch of sheep, got on his knees and prayed to receive Christ outside of the, the town that he lived in. And he, became, he went from being a Muslim to becoming a Christian. He went in town and he started asking the imams questions. What about this and what about that? And before very long, he was told, you're not allowed to ask any more questions. And today, he's one of the main teachers and preachers in eastern Algeria. Today, he's one of the ones who is a key shepherd for the people of Algeria, a true shepherd that went from the full circle of an agricultural sense to a spiritual sense. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of what God has done. But I want you to see that the ways of God are very often very opposite of the ways of our world. If you were to write out some words out there to the side from that top list that would capture what those attitudes and what those actions are like, the, the forces that are necessary, it would be very different from the bottom list. You see, at the top, you would probably find pride. You would probably find power. You would probably find position, prestige, all of those things. Pride, we call those the poisonous peas in our leadership here at the life of the church. Pride, power, position, and prestige. If that's what you're after in church leadership, that is poison to the church. Pride, power, position, and prestige. But when you begin to see humility, when you begin to see faithfulness, when you begin to see servanthood, when you begin to see persistence, when you begin to see the other things that are here, cleanliness and holiness, that's number seven, when you begin to see these other things at the bottom part of the list, then you're beginning to see what Paul is saying to Titus, Titus, you've got to have the right leaders. If you don't have the right leaders, you're not going to have the right church. 
Okay, safe to turn your page over here. Let's look and let's see. In verse 6 it says, look at the um, statement that's at the top. If anyone is above reproach, that's the first thing. So he's saying appoint leaders, and here it is. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Verse 7, for an overseer as God's steward must be what? Above reproach. Well, who is qualified in this? This begins one of the first lists. You see, who is qualified to be an elder or a pastor or an overseer in the body of the church? This is an enormously important issue to God and to his people. We see this throughout the scripture that the Bible gives great amount of attention to the fact that a church better be very careful who it puts in leadership. If you don't do that, as we've said, there will be consequences that will lead the church away from the gospel. You see, it, this should be important to us, too. This should be important to Sheridan Hills, that we pay attention to this, not just for the senior pastor, but for the others who are on the pastoral team and in the months, in the years, in the decades, in the future, that we would say, oh no, our church realizes that God warns us who ought to be considered leaders. The Bible warns us about how this ought to go, what it ought to look like. The Bible warns us about what kind of leaders to avoid, and the Bible shows us about what kind of leaders to accept. And so we, as a church, will do well. Now, there's two lists given in the, in the New Testament. Notice the next statement here. There are two overlapping lists in this. And I want you to see that these two overlapping lists are from Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Both of these lists are important lists. Now, as part of this, the... The first qualification that is here is, as you see here, above reproach. That's the first thing that's listed. And there's a few things I want you to notice here. Anakaletos. Anakaletos is the word that means above reproach. And notice what it means. The first thing is there, blameless. That this guy is somebody who is not blamed. He's not done things that are full of blame. Look at the next part there. He cannot be accused. This is not someone that in the public realm, in his public reputation, is not someone who is, is accused by the things that are here. Also, another way to say it is, he's not called into question. That immediately when someone hears his name or, or sees that, that they're immediately thinking questionable things about him. This is a very, very difficult and high thing to process for human beings. Because all of us, the Bible tells us, are sinners. The Bible tells us all of us have fallen away and fallen short from who God has called us to be. And the Bible tells us that there is none perfect, no, not one that it was only Jesus who could pay for the sins of the world. So your pastor is not called to be one who is sinlessly perfect, as we'll see, but we do see that there's this very high standard put, not only upon pastors, but we see this exact same phraseology is used in 1 Timothy chapter 3 when it talks about deacons. Deacons also are to be above reproach. And I want you to see what this means. The first thing is, the first observation that I want you to notice here is, is that it is repeated. And so it's not said just once, but it's said twice, and if you want to make a note out there to the side, it's the overarching idea of the qualifications. You see it in verse 6. Look at the top of the page. If anyone is above reproach, and then at the end of verse 7 it says, for an overseer, um, as God's steward, must be above reproach. Twice we see it. When the Bible repeats things, it's a good idea for you to take a second look. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing for you to notice. Um, very often a point is being made. The second thing I want you to notice there, that this same word, this same phrase, and even a derivative of this word is used at the top of the list in Timothy. So I've said, said to you, it's both in 1 Titus 
and it's in Timothy that these lists show up about the qualifications, and this is also at the top of the list in, in Timothy. So this is an important issue. Above reproach, not easily blamed, not, not to be accused publicly. Now, as I've said, number three is, it does not mean sinless perfection. It does not mean that that there's this idea that Christians can eventually get to the place where they don't sin anymore. Um, that is a heresy. That is a false doctrine that some have taught through the years that eventually, because of the Holy Spirit living within you, you can come to a place where you no longer sin. There was a great preacher early in America. It was named Charles Finney, and he went through a time of believing in sinless perfection. And that is, not, that is not a doctrine that is congruent with Scripture. We see that as long as we're in this life and as long as we're in this world, that we are going to deal with sin at different times. And so we should be especially concerned when a pastor, whether he has a TV ministry or not, declares himself to be sinlessly perfect. Um, because all you have to do is look at his wife. She's rolling her eyes. Um, right? Just look at Marcy. If I ever say that, just look at Marcy and say, is he reached sinless perfection? And she'll tell you all about it. So look at number four. It does, it does mean a man who has a clear reputation spiritually and morally. That's the picture that is here. That his relationship spiritually with God is right and that his relationship and his reputation with other people is right. Now, he's not going to perfectly walk with God. There's going to be areas in which he fails in his relationship with God. Yes, that, that is true. But his life is not at all characterized, and his reputation is not one that, that well, as we'll see here, is not one that is immediately tarnished. But when we look at this man, we would say, no, he has the reputation of having a right relationship with God, and he has the reputation of having a right relationship with the people around him, morally, the people that are, that are connected to him. So fill this in. Here's the key test, and circle this, the key test. Secret, circle those words. When people hear his name, what comes to their minds? You see, this is, a, this is a good way to think about being above reproach. When people hear his name, do they immediately think of scandal? Do they immediately think of fraud? Do they immediately think of ingenuine? Do they immediately think of, of things that are negative and wrong? Or when they hear his name, do they immediately think of honor and that which is right? Now, let me share with you a blessing that I had this week. Um, at the beginning of this week, I was out at Cleveland Clinic in a doctor's office. And while I was there talking with someone, a lady said, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. She said, really? Pastor? Don't see that every day? Okay. She goes, what, pastor, what church are you at? And I said, well, I'm a pastor, one of the pastors at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. She goes, no way! And I thought, oh, no. What does this mean? And she said, Pastor Billingsley rocks. That's what she said. She said, I grew up right there on Raleigh Street, three doors down from Pastor Billingsley and Mrs. Billingsley. And I loved them. She said, I grew up with Laura Jane. And I grew up in their house. And they, they just, they were great people. Now, I'm Jewish, but I mean, it was, they were great. I love them. I mean, and she said, I would go to the church, and I would sit there, and I felt so much peace. I just felt peace. You know, too. That's what she said, literally what she said. And you know, I just sat there, and I, and I thought about what I was going to preach to you today. And I thought, praise God that the reputation of our pastor from all my years growing up was one that somebody says, he rocks. He was... This was right. And she said he was just such a great man. And so the, part of the picture here is that, that there needs to be a reputation that's not, oh, I know him. 
You see, when, when that's the reputation, um, this is what brings shame to the gospel and shame to the church as opposed to that which brings honor and glory and blessing. So the highest overarching qualification that we see is the first one that is mentioned here, and it is to, that he is to be spiritually, fill this in, spiritually and morally pure. He is to have a reputation as being spiritually and morally pure. Spiritually having to do with he and God, and morally having to do with he and man. Spiritually and morally pure. You see, we see in the scripture also that his life must be worthy of imitation. His life must be worthy of imitation. This is God's plan that his earthly leaders, even though that they are imperfect and they too are subjects of his grace, that even though they're imperfect, that they can still be that which is to be, that their example is to be able to be followed, that he should be able to say, follow my example. Now, there's some passages out there to the side. You see 1 Thessalonians 2 and 2 Thessalonians 3, both of those areas that are there, is this idea of where the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, be like me. What you saw in me, I want you to do. Look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. He says it very clearly. This is important that a pastor have the reputation where this can be said. Look at verse 3 in verse, chapter 3 and verse 17. Brethren, join in what? Can you underline that on your outline? Following my example. Join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us according to the pattern that you have in us. It's this idea of following after the pattern that is right. I'll never forget when this concept hit me like a ton of bricks. I was in France, I was leading one of the projects that were in France, and I was preparing for a Bible study. There was a group of young people that had been there working very, very hard, probably about 20, 25 young people, that had been going through a lot of difficulty in sharing the gospel with Muslims in France. And uh, the group was pretty beaten up. The group had been through a hard week. They had worked very, very hard in the course of things. And somewhere along the way, this, one of these passages, and I don't remember exactly which one it was, there's about eight of them where the Apostle Paul is saying, what you've seen in me, do. Be like me. And I remember it just hitting me that it is the responsibility of every pastor and every spiritual leader to live his life so he can say with a clear conscience, do what I do. Follow my example. And I have to tell you that that is a difficult thing for me because my sin is ever before me. I am a pastor who still sins. I am a pastor who sees the attitudes and the actions and the words of my own mind and my own heart and my own deficiencies and everything else that's very real and very much there. And it says, Lord, how in the world? But let me tell you that that is why we are together in the church family. The church family looks together at our lives together, not just my life, but your life. And the picture is, is that we come together to seek to live in accountability and in support and in help so that we can determine, is this reputation right? Is this what should be followed? Should we pursue in this way? Should we follow this leader? You see, that's the responsibility of the church to do together. And let me tell you that that's one of the greatest blessings upon my life is that you are looking at me and that you are looking at Pastor Lucas and that you are looking at Pastor Ben and that you are looking at others who are in leadership, that the accountability is here that we live and work together and seek to honor what God has said. And so I just remember that that began to help me in my own Christian life. There would be temptations that would come along and I would say, wait a minute, 
I'm supposed to be an example. How many of you have ever been positively affected by that? Maybe your own children. You're sitting there running along through life and you go, well, I could do it. Oh, wait a minute. Alex and Michelle and Stephanie are watching me. They're going to see what I do. You see, accountability is a great thing and it can help you walk with God. We shouldn't shirk accountability. We shouldn't shirk responsibility in that regard. We ought to let God use it in our lives. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. He's, he's writing, Peter is writing to the elders that are there. And he says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, and here's his instruction, shepherd the flock. Do you remember what we said about being a shepherd? He's telling them, you shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge. But look what it says. But being examples to the flock. You see, the way of God's leadership is a gentle and loving and kind leadership. It's not, it's not a leadership that is centered on the individual. It's a leadership that is centered upon Christ. It's a, it's a life that is living as an example. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we want to look at this um, very carefully. Notice this. Get ready to underline a couple of things. Look what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal, and here it is. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from what? Iniquity. That means sin. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord to depart from iniquity. Look at verse 20. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Here's the idea. There's some vases and cups and utensils in the, church, in, in the house that in a, think of ancient Rome or ancient, ancient period around this. There's some of, those, some of those nice things that are gold and silver, maybe a, a beautiful chalice or maybe a comb, or a brush, or maybe there's, there's something else along those lines that is made of something very nice and it's beautiful. But there's also instruments in the home that are used for perhaps sweeping the floor. They're used for daily dishes, or maybe even daily bathroom stuff, okay? So I want you to see this, that's the idea that's here, is that there's different, there's different vessels in the house and those different vessels, some of them you look and you put out there by the front door in the china cabinet so when people come in, they see the nice pretty things that you have, right? That's the gold and the silver and the china. Of course, they didn't have china back then, but okay, so the beautiful glazed pottery that they had. But then, how bizarre would it be if by the front door of your home, you put the bedpan? You'd come in the front door and you'd go, oh, nice to see you. I mean, that would be very bizarre. It's a, it's a vessel of, that's not honorable. It's not a vessel that you put out there for, to see, it's not a vessel that is, is that which people are going to say, oh, yeah, pass the bedpan. I mean, the, the picture is here, it's, it's very, very different. Now, I want you to notice this with me. Let's read this again, and let's see if it starts to make some more sense. But in verse, verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names of the Lord depart from iniquity. Here it is in verse 20. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful in the ma to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You see, part of the picture of what a pastor is, is to be is a vessel that is honorable, that is clean, 
It hasn't been left with food all over it or haven't been left with refuse all over it or some other thing all over it. It, it is that which is clean and that which is ready to be used. Now, when you, when you have leaders in the life of the church that are not clean, that are not holy, that are like the world, that are tarnished and dirty with the world, how can they be used by God? That's the picture that is here. So church family, as we look at what kind of church we are called to be and what kind of lives we are called to live, we need to see that God places a high value on our purity. And not only on our pastoral purity, but listen to this, on all of our purity. Because our God is a holy God, and he blesses when his children are like him. So Let's wrap up, and I want you to see these last two statements that are here. A pastor's talk or his doctrine must be right. One of the key ways in which you know whether or not this pastor is the right pastor and whether this pastor is the kind of pastor that is going to lead the church correctly is whether or not his doctrine and what he teaches are correct. That is incredibly important. But not only that, we also say, and his, let's say it out loud together, his walk must what? Match his talk. Now, it, this has to do with his reputation. Is he a lying, thieving, conniving, scandalous, sensual, leader that's greedy, or is he measured by that which has a reputation which is right? You see, here's the thing though, the same is true for all believers. And we see this in verse 19. If you have your pen, underline this in verse 19. The Lord knows who are his. Now this is talking about all of us. The Lord knows who's, who are his. Are you one of his? Look at the next line. Let everyone circle the word everyone. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. You see, it is God's will that his people live holy lives. And so it makes sense that pastors should be an example of that. But here's the deal. How's the application for you and me? Not only as we consider the church, but as we consider our own lives. Look at the last line. Are your beliefs clear and true to God's word? That is a question that you really need to be careful about. Are your beliefs, your beliefs, clear and true to God's word? Or do you believe popular theology, you know, if, you know, if it feels good, you know, how can it be so wrong if it feels so right? Or, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's on their own path, there's many ways to heaven. I mean, all of the popular theologies that are around us. Do you think like the world, or do you think like what God's word says? I am the Lord your God. I am the creator of heaven and earth. I am the savior of those. Who, anyone who comes and believes in me, he can have salvation in Christ. I mean, this is the picture that God has, a very exclusive path um, to write being right with God. Are your beliefs clear and true to God's word or are they more like the world's? Well, then the second question is, how about your behavior? Do you live like the world or do you live like God says? You see, God is calling us to be a people who live what we believe. And that begins with pastors when it comes to the issue of leadership. Would you stand with me for prayer?